what you were just talking about is kind of like the most important thing that we can talk about is that reality exists the way that it does because there is a pre-eternal reality that allows us to exist the way that we do and that pre-eternal reality is obviously the trinity and we see this as both a philosophical truth that we can like investigate it's also just something that we practically experience in our everyday life how we live in relation to other people it's impossible to live alone in like the most extreme sense of the word alone it's impossible to do that no matter what you do you will always be reliant on other people in some way or another and that's just a practical truth of life but it also goes deeper than just that practical aspect it's also just a philosophical truth which i don't know if you want to get into that right now on the whole like a equals a the law of identity we could get into that or we could also get mm. into the biblical side of things as well where we see right. that at the very heart of creation genesis 1 we already see that the fundamental principle of reality which is the same principle of the trinity is that of communion communion is mm -hmm. what allows creation to exist precisely because god is communion that is what god is right yeah i think a good place to start honestly would be the laws of logic stuff and so the sort of the point of this and why this stream i'm anticipating is going to be pretty long is that we want to show the communal worldview at every aspect of reality and we do we believe in a hierarchy of of um like a hierarchical creation hierarchical reality and we believe that this applies to the domain of knowledge itself so one example is the fact that philosophy is or metaphysics obviously conceptually precedes something like physics um because the natural sciences always are dependent upon metaphysical presuppositions um given this hierarchy and given this the fact that a hierarchy in christianity is not a hierarchy of domination not one of alienation but of mutual interiority of the higher entering into the lower this is perfectly expressed obviously in the person of christ who is quite literally the highest entering into the lowest god himself entering into death um so given this worldview all the dif different domains of knowledge they fit together within this symbolic worldview. And that's really the meaning of symbolism that we're going to talk about later on. It's the bringing together of distinct realities within sort of an intelligible unity. Um, now, with the laws of logic, the laws of logic are just one example of the necessity of communion within any particular inquiry, inquiry we could take. So um, when we're talking about logic, we are basically talking about the intelligibility of being, the, intellig the laws of logic are true because they're true about God eternally, but they're true in the sense that um, may not be um, for our fallen superficial minds. It may not be immediate because um, the laws of logic, the way they're typically formulated, are limited by the fact that implicitly they presuppose a non-communal worldview and therefore they are falling into bad abstractions. I've talked about this a lot before, but the simplest way to show this is the fact that A equals A is a tautology and a tautology is ultimately meaningless. To say e, A equals A, this bare, empty statement of identity, it, it ultimately means nothing and it doesn't really say, it doesn't say anything at all, again, because it's a tautology. Now, that doesn't mean it's not true, but because we are created beings and we um, are um, always dynamically existing, we're existing as, I mean, this is basic orthodox theology kind of person never, ex or nature never exists, form never exists without a particular hypostatic, personal, concrete expression of the nature, right? And this, when we talk about the, our concrete personal existence. We're talking about our existence within a relational world, our existence within the creation where I breathe, I speak, I take, I give. This is the communal nature of creation. Now, this, in terms of the empirical point here, the na uh, point, really a, a scientific point, almost a point, of, uh, point about the physical nature of reality, it ties in very well with our understanding of communal logic or however you want to put it. Um, so I've been sort of beating around the point to get to the essence of communal logic is that the tautology of A equals A, while true, it is true. Like we believe in unity and distinction. If you don't have a principle of identity, of, of, of self-sameness, then you don't have identity. So the father, even in, in Trinitarian theology, the father is not the son nor the spirit, vice versa, right? Um, but at the same time, this identity of A cannot be conceived without union with the other, without presupposing 
the other. Because if you think about it, implicit within the tautological empty formula A equals A, or it's meaningless at face value if you don't go into it. But if we go into it, if we search what, what's really being said, what, what is actually expressed, what's the inner life of this truth? Well, to say that A equals A is to say necessarily by implication that A is not B. And this negative relation to B, the fact that it is not B, is implicit to what makes A A. Part of what makes A the fact that it is A is the fact that it is not B or it is not something other. So this, in terms of logic, is a very simple way to demonstrate the communal nature of, well, logic, but, but of being in general, right? It is the fact that identity itself, our conception of identity, um, typically, if we're understanding it in terms of self-isolation, self-relation, self-reference, this will fail because this is tautological. Identity is only found in movement towards the, the other, and this is a Trinitarian point. So we're still kind of on the Trinitarian section, but I really want to emphasize this, that the reason why, the, the, the reason why is not something you can deduce logically. The reason why A requires B that is just a fact that we can know. But the reason, the explanation for it is that logic is um, a way of talking about the divine mind. Um, it is a way of speaking of the inner rationality of God. And the inner rationality, rationa the truth of rationality is not self-relation, but the abstract formula of A equals A is sort of the quintessential example of, of self-relation. Now, before I stop talking, I'm going to point everyone to our, one of our favorite books here at Tila Span, which is The Pillar and Ground of the Truth by Pavel Florensky. This is where you get sort of the best critique of the abstract law of identity A equals A. But I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah. Um, uh, a way to make it a little more digestible, I think, for most people is think about the world. Think about if the world, if everything in the world was yellow. Yellow is the only color that exists. We wouldn't have a word for yellow just because there would be no reason to describe yellow. That's just what everything is. There's no reason to distinguish between yellowness and any other sort of state of being, just because the only state of being that exists is yellowness. But the second you introduce another color, let's say there's yellow and blue, now you have a reason to give yellow an identity. Um, and identity is ultimately meaning. Meaning is the same thing as identity. It's the, it is the being of a thing. And that is only possible in and through a relation between one thing and another thing. So you can also think about it as if, let's say, every piece of music ever made was by Bach. We would never listen to a piece and be like, oh, wow, I love this piece by Bach. No, you just say, oh, I love this piece. There's no reason to clarify the fact that it's by Bach because everybody already knows that that's just all there is so I think that's just a way to make the idea behind what Trey is saying a little more digestible for people right. who aren't familiar like myself with the laws of logic and all of that yeah all that nerd stuff yeah. Um, yeah, no, that's a really important point. And kind of the essence, it gets to the essence of communion, which is unity in distinction, right? It's okay. So this is so crucial. Unity does not supersede distinction, nor does distinction uh, precede or supersede unity. Rather, unity is manifested in distinction. And um, I think we're going to have to get get at this at some point. I, I think we can get at, it, get at it now. The way you can ultimately demonstrate that unity or identity has to be unity and distinction identity being has to be communal it cannot be self-referential is the fact that a self-referential ontology ultimately fails it collapses into nothing i think philosophically the best demonstration of this is honestly the beginning of hegel's science of logic where he demonstrates that pure indeterminate being that is being without distinctions and this is something all hearts i know he's going to be able to riff on being without distinctions is synonymous with nothing Pure being is nothing. And Hegel goes a different route than we would want to go here. I mean, like, Hart kind of makes this point. Like, as soon as you accept the first step of Hegel, you've kind of started in the wrong place. And it's kind of like with Hart himself, all Hart. It's like, once you accept the presuppositions, the whole worldview flows from it. So once you sort of accept Hartian metaphysical presuppositions, you're going to be like, you know, female priests in 20 years. You know, it's it's logical. So, um, uh, but the thing with the... Yeah, I, I'm going to leave this to Allhart because we've been talking about this a lot. The fact that if you don't have a principle of distinction, and ultimately, I think Allhart is going to want to talk about modern materialism and naturalism. Without a principle of distinction, you can't actually articulate a, a coherent 
coherent worldview. And this is where we would make an almost platonic critique of materialism because the problem is that they don't emphasize unity. Now, that doesn't mean that we are Platonists because our critique of Plato, and if you watch my conversation on this channel with Erval, the Neoplatonist, very, very smart guy, um, this was the problem we kept running in. He couldn't conceive distinction. He, when he was trying to conceive of salvation, of union with the one, he couldn't have this understanding that we have of theosis, adoption of sons, where we remain um, distinct uh, human created humans, yet we become uncreated by grace. He doesn't have this principle of unity and distinction of the higher entering and the lower. So the, uh, the lower entering the higher has to be one of reduction of the particularities of the lower, which the distinctions in the lowerness in Neoplatonism is already conceived as sort of a falling away, an alienation from a primordial goodness, which is just like, if you think through this logically, this means that all the relationships you've ever had with human beings are ultimately nothing. They're meaningless. If the distinctions between them, if the identities themselves are not, don't have some eternal significance to them. And this is something um, Father Staniloy talks about in the experience of God. But um, yeah, I'm going to pass it off to Allhart because this idea of unity in distinction and both sides needing to be emphasized, not to the negation of the other, but to the affirmation of each other in their mutual interiority, their mutual impl um, ex ex they mutually self-explain each other, right? The unity is explained by the distinction, the oneness of God we can articulate within a Trinitarian um, c conception of God, um, and only within a tr Trinitarian conception of God. So yeah, all heart, I'll pass it off to you. Yeah, yeah. You get into a lot of stuff that uh, J.P. Marceau, the host of that um, Symbolic World Metaphysics course that I'm, I'm taking, uh, gets into a lot as well. Um, yeah, so basically, yeah, so, so Marceau's uh, course is structured basically, you know, uh, beginning with the insufficiencies of materialism, reductionist naturalism, um, both from a kind of uh, top-down and bottom-up perspective, which I'll get into in a sec. And then he goes to, he kind of recognizes these insufficiencies and sees how they are ultimately resolved by classical metaphysics, that is like Plato, Aristotle, Plotinus, and then how there are still some insufficiencies there and then why he bridges over into, um, into a, a full like a uh, Christian metaphysic, a la, you know, a C.S. Lewis's uh, book Miracles, which we've covered on this channel before if people want to hear that discussed. But um, yeah, so um, this principle of distinction is really is really key for any knowledge. I mean, a, a lot of guys make this point, but it, it really is true because, um, as John Verveke's pointed out, uh, basically if you don't if you don't uh, acknowledge distinction, you end up collapsing all of the things a scientist studies, for example, um, and you all postulates, all objects of thought end up being deconstructed as well. But this is especially uh, trans, you know, apparent in the uh, in the material sciences in a way I can I can explain. So. Basically, John Verveke, and he's not the only one, he's just a particularly um, lucid and perceptive uh, example. Uh, he's noticed that modern science, contemporary scientific uh, study, is basically a praxis without, a, without a, a metaphysic to ground it. So, you know, we're, we're studying these things, but ultimately we have a metaphysic, that is reductionist materialism, that undermines our ability to study things at all. Because... Uh, materialist metaphysics is basically um, uh, an infinite regress of reducing holes to their parts. Um, in materialism, there can't be any hole that is irreducible to its parts or uh, has qualities which are ultimately um, not explicable by its, its parts. Um, this is what David Bentley Hart is getting at, if you've heard him say that anytime a scientist talks about emergence, you can just replace that with magic, with hand waving, because basically they're they're relying on a, a principle which they could never explain within their ontology, and that is emergence. So John Verbeke sees this, and a lot of other scientists see this too. To something you can look at, like Don Hoffman or um, or uh, Bernardo Castro. There's various other you know f figures in scientific fields, uh, philosophy of mind, uh, neuroscience, cognitive science, or even just you know biology and and physics that uh, recognize basically we have this thing emergence that we need to uh, have a, an ontology which can explain because we need a uh, emergence to to be able to study anything in particular so if you're a materialist what you're going to want to do is look is if you're consistent you're going to look at say you study beavers 
They're going to reduce the beavers to their cells, but okay, we can't stop there because those cells are reducible to the molecules which make them up, and those are reducible to atoms, and those atoms are reducible to subatomic particles, and those subatomic particles are reducible to some kind of wave. And eventually, you either get to a point where um, you get nothing, which is what um, Ed Fazer points out in his book, uh, Aristotle's Revenge. Um, yeah. You basically get to a point of prime matter. So at that point, yeah. you're already kind of conceding a, a classical metaphysical ontology because you're, ta you're talking about form and matter at that point. Or you get to a point where there's uh, there's really nothing you, you're studying. Um, so you end up having to, you know, uh, John Verbeke talks about how it's uh, if you look at materialists and if they were consistent, they would end up with a, a conclusion of like a radical monism where basically everything that exists, everything you could possibly um, study in a scientific field or in a philosophical context or even just think or experience in your day-to-day -day life is ultimately an illusion. You end up with like an almost like uh, like radically like Far Eastern uh, notion if you're if you're consistently a materialist. But the materialist doesn't want to do that because he wants to study beavers and um, and do sociology and and study you know uh, hydrogen atoms and all this kind of stuff. So what they end up having to do, and this is quickly becoming apparent um, for various reasons is acknowledge the classical metaphysical distinction between form and matter. So you have prime matter, which is this qualityless potential for instantiation, and then you have a form, which is identity, um, which is what uh, Verbeke likes to call gestalt, um, to use the German term. It's this kind of structural, functional pattern that is then instantiated in matter. Um, and so this is really actually fundamental to do any thought, but especially any science. And certainly, like science, scientists now are realizing that, that uh, this kind of stuff, and this is why they're pivoting away from um, uh, reductionist materialism and towards basically a kind of platonic uh, naturalism. Um, mm -hmm. So, and of course, there's uh, as as J.P. Marceau as 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 illustrated on his channel and, and is doing in this course, you can really uh, bridge quite nicely from this uh, non-reductionist, like platonic or Aristotelian naturalism to a kind of holistically Christian metaphysic. And, yeah. uh, and really that's, it's, it's, a, it's intuitive to do. Right. Yeah. I mean, the move to personalism almost follows logically from Neoplatonism because all the deadlocks really of Neoplatonism are due to an inability to conceive of the category of the person and of true mutual interiority, which personhood ultimately implies as uh, father Staniloy explains in a mind blowingly, uh, well-written chapter of the experience of god called uh holy trinity the structure of supreme love um yeah but uh, nate you haven't talked for a while what, what, are, what one more thing before nate so uh, yeah yeah go ahead i know actually ahead. this will be a bridge to what he's going to talk about because this is this is the biblical stuff when it says in the beginning of genesis god created heaven and earth what is that referring to but matterless form and formless matter it's it's actuality and potentiality it's yin and yang Contemporary science is realizing that we need essentially an ontology that is about the communion of heaven and earth to even do any science at all. So yeah. with that, I'll hand it off to you, Nate. I'm glad I'm glad you did that for my uh, for my uneducated self that uh, that makes things a little easier to transition because I uh, I'm ready to talk about the biblical side of things where we see all the way back in Genesis one that the foundation of reality is the Trinitarian pre-eternal reality of communion father son holy spirit um i think that it's fundamental to the understanding that we have of communion to understand that with interior to reality and interior to communion itself because communion is reality uh there is hierarchy it's not just a and b just looking at each other on this um two-dimensional or one-dimensional or i guess it would be a two-dimensional plane there's a three-dimensional aspect to it where there's uh a structure to the way that communion and reality works and we see this in the trinity itself we see father son holy spirit uh father obviously being the masculine you know head and then son being the the feminine side of that relationship with the holy spirit mediating between them and now when i say masculine and feminine you shouldn't be thinking in the terms of male and female. Male and female is, generally speaking, a masculine-feminine relationship, but that is not what masculinity and femininity is. And this is a very fundamental point to understanding communion and understanding, I mean, modern gender theory, uh, even, 
masculinity and femininity are a spiritual reality beyond the social constructs that we have and beyond biological sex itself uh masculinity and femininity are just kind of words that we put on the philosophical notions of procession and reversion to use dionysian terminology uh where masculine is the initiatory procession that gives itself initially and then feminine is that which receives that interprets it and reciprocates it and that's what we see in the trinitarian relationship the father who is the the monarch of the trinity he is the initiator of uh the trinity he gives himself in his entirety to the son as the masculine and the son takes that and instantly without time he reciprocates that love back to the father because it's eternity there is no waiting there is no time it happens instantaneously but of course this has to happen through the holy spirit because there can't just be this two-dimensional dyad of two things just looking at each other getting lost in this two-dimensionality there has to be that hierarchical structure to it to allow for expansion in all directions there can't just be this two-dimensional line a line is meaningless a line goes nowhere there's nowhere for a line to go because it's the same from beginning to end and there is no beginning or end without a three-dimensionality to it the three-dimensionality opens up this dyad towards a true infinity which isn't just mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. horizontal lame yeah. existence yeah. and if you think about it like there is a reason why the holy spirit the third is associated with the with revelation um with creation in the nicene creed too um and with union bringing together i mean the body of christ is united in the spirit it's because the spirit is the third in whom the self and other the the male and female the the subject and the well predicate isn't the right word i'm that's bulgar coffee and stuff but um um, in any case, the self and the other, where two individuals are united, they're united in the third, always. And this is like, this is a genuine Trinitarian symbol, and I really want to emphasize it. It's that communion for us, and this relates back to what we opened with, communal, communal ontology is Trinitarian ontology, it's Christianity, it's Christian metaphysics. Um, communion is always triune like the the most fundamental pattern of communion is triunity it, it you cannot reduce further um you can add to this so this is what florensky kind of demonstrates logically um or not purely rationalistically but he he demonstrates that um a uh um, that three is basically the necessary number to conceive of identity um i'm not sure i was talking with Allhart about this last night i don't know if i fully buy everything Florensky does. However, um, Father Staniloy, who is basically a saint, no one sort of denies his theological brilliance and orthodoxy, he quotes Florensky in the experience of God in on this specific point where Florensky demonstrated the contingency, the non-necessity of any fourth hypostasis, of any fourth principle. But why, okay, maybe we, maybe it's too uh, again, I don't even buy, I, I don't even know if I buy Florensky's argument here, but I, I agree fundamentally that we can demonstrate that three is necessary, at least in relation to two, because this is a big question. I always get it. Um, people ask, well, if communion, if the self and the other being united is what communion is, why do we need a Trinitarian worldview? Why not just a, du uh, a dualism? Why not father and son in eternal love? The reason why I think we can, I don't think really you can provide a sort of totalizing you know philosophical argument for god himself why god subsists the way he does but based on the revelation of god within the world within uh creation which is naturally patterned upon him i think we can make arguments and one great way of de demonstrating it is the fact that if communion is the self moving towards the other ecstatically in love imagine let's just take me and all heart for example imagine if our ecstatic communion was or, uh, pause but uh for the metaphor, let's just imagine the way I am relating with all heart is us just nose to nose, face to face like this, you know, um, just for eternity. That's not true relation. True relation is when the two are brought together and then move outwards into the infinite world beyond into the third into. The so there's three principles of reality here. There is the self. There is you. If we're speaking subjectively, it's you knowing others and all others can sort of be put under this category of others within the world, right? Um, so, so it, but the fundamental irreducible categories are you, self, the other, the predicate, the subject predicate, and then the copula, 
um, I will probably have to unpack this more, which is the third that unites them. So um, even if you think about two objects coming together, right, this is relational ontology, right? They're coming together, they're being united. Um, if, if there is no, um, if it's just purely two dimensional, it's either they smash into each other and are reduced to one dimensions. So ultimately it's incoherence or they just fly outwards into equally one dimensional points. So um, this is why you need a third because the third is analogous to the space yeah, wherein also, the two meet. So real quick, in order for two objects to collide with each other, there has to be a third principle, whether that's like the yeah. laws of motion or whatever, or time, there has to be some sort of law which exists that allows the two to join with each yeah, other. And yeah, that's what the Holy yeah. Spirit is the principle right. of. The yep. law of love, if you want to call him that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.